So finding a path from historic reconciliation towards new economic identity, this is the segment we want to talk about more right now in coming um, coming minutes. And first, before introducing a guest, I want to uh, show you um, an infographic um, about the economic uh, past of Ukraine. What's interesting about it is to see how all other Soviet states were pre performing since 1992. It's percentage change real GDP per capita. So it's capita because it basically says uh, how quickly people got wealthy in those countries after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. And we see that Ukraine is performing the worst among, and it's just like a country that's performing the best, but Ukraine is, is the worst performing country from the whole Soviet uh, bloc right now. So there is a lot of job to do ahead at reforming and trying to catch up. And it's very weird because Ukraine is 45 million country with huge economic potential, uh, with uh, super rich oligarchs, and you have all opportunities in the world to, to get yourself enriched. And uh, that's what we're gonna talk, what's wrong and how to fix it. Right, and today in our studio we have joining us to help answer some of these questions the first Deputy Minister of Econom Economic Development and Trade, Sasha Borovic. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us. And um, I, should you want to start with the... Yeah, I, I, I think <laughs> we uh, starting, uh, started speaking about new economic identity and uh, six years of recessions or feeble growth. And it seems like, of course, the war in Eastern Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. And it seems like right now, the Ukrainian economy will never gonna look like the same again. And before it was industrial powerhouse with manufacturing, coal mining, leading the industries. And right now, um, you know, we see um, only agriculture performing. Uh, so what are those priorities right now when it comes to economic uh, I will use the Soviet term, economic plan for Ukraine in coming years. First of all, thank you for inviting me. I have a lot of respect for what you guys do. I think it's great. And it's nice to be here. Uh, the questions are hard, and let's see how I can do it. Um, you saw that Ukraine is doing much worse than Belarus is. Belarus has barely touched reforms. They never, they never went for reforms. If you looked at and Russia, they run fairly serious cuts, serious reforms, and they're doing not as well as they should, but they are doing more or less all right. Ukrainian problem is that Ukraine has done half reforms, and it's an excellent case study to demonstrate that half reforms basically don't work. They took us to 36% uh, of what Ukraine was uh, before the... Uh, you have optimistic view because Union. many say that Ukraine weren't for reforms at all. Well, no, no, there were reforms. There were, there were some economic reforms. Uh, let's not go into history too much. Let's go into the future. And um, what I would argue is Ukraine should not go for gradual reforms. Ukraine should go for fast, bold, deep reforms that would change the way the society and the economy functions. Um, that's not the universal view. There is a view that maybe we should not run as fast as, as, as I would argue, before the local elections, because that would be a problem. Um, the uh, thing is that we have inherited from the Soviet Union the major welfare state, and people got used to that welfare, and they don't want to get out of it. We spend about 53% of our GDP on public expenditures, of which 18% go to pensions, about 8% goes to subsidies, and etc. Mm -hmm. And to move forward, we need to dismantle that welfare, and we need to offer a different welfare, and also we need to change the way the economy functions. Right now, it barely does. We got to the stage of bankruptcy. Our uh, numbers don't look good. We believe, or there is an expectation, that the GDP would drop by 7.5 percent. Optimistic. Optimistic. Yeah. Pessimistic I want to play is, uh, this infograph we have about no, uh, worst performing and best performing industries in Ukraine in, re uh, in last year. Uh, and you can see clearly that you have agriculture. Interesting thing about agriculture, that it's the only uh, sector of economy that was 
expanding through all six years despite recessions. And we had to put real estate as best performing, minus 3.2%, because everything else except public uh, expenditure is in deep, deep red. So it seems like, especially for manufacturing and mining, do you think it's those interests, especially because they're mostly based in Eastern Ukraine, there are no chances to uh, go back to them or to uh, get back that powerful growth that we're, they were contributing to the Ukrainian economy? That's a part of it. The other part is that many of those industries, many of the companies from those industries were performing right or rather well because of the subsidies, because of the state assistance through mm -hmm. tariffs, through uh, whatever uh, support they were getting from the state. I would argue that the new Ukrainian economy should get free of those subsidies, should get free of any support that the state would give to the failing industries, and it would have to... Ukraine basically need to give it to the invisible hand to uh, regulate the market. The state over the 25 years has demonstrated that it cannot do a very good job to build the economy, rebuild the economy, restructure the economy, etc. So in my view, it has to withdraw and it has to let the economy sort it out itself. And that's a controversial view because if you look at what Ukrainian options are, Ukrainian options are to uh, follow the the general EU model mm -hmm. where everything is fairly well regulated, mm -hmm. sometimes heavily regulated, or to take the, say, the US system where it's a, a liberal approach to the economy. And you're closer to what? You know, I came done. here as a, I recently moved to the country, I lived for 25 years outside, and I, as I was moving here, I was a social democrat within the European definition of it. When I looked at our state's ability to accomplish things, I very quickly figured that in Ukraine, and also with how little credit the, the population gives to the government, mm -hmm. to me it seems that the best, the go and also how messed up the economy is, to me, the best is not to try to re-engineer it, but to give the invisible hand the chance to sort this out and then start putting mm -hmm. the light touches to things so to help things I out. Want, I want to, I'm sorry, I, I want to just profile your um, article from uh, back in the, I think in January, right, before you got the sure. government job. And it, it says Ukraine should consider default, and it was very popular and very, um, High, uh, widely discussed article. And basically, you said that um, uh, Ukraine should uh, uh, should go for default, and this is a quote. With this in view, it may be, make both political and economic sense for Western creditors to let Ukraine default, and this may uh, give them a stronger voice in the slow and ineffective while the system uh, as, uh, I'm sorry, voicing the post default restructuring. Reforms so far have been slow and ineffective while the system of using the Western funds remains non-transparent. Uh, do you still hold this view that Ukraine should consider default? Uh, I'm now a government official. <laughs> Whatever I say exactly my may, be, may be, may be uh, viewed as, a, as the government's position. I'm not close to the situation. Uh, the Ministry of Finance has consolidated the debt and is making the decisions as to what it should do. Uh, the way I look at things, I pretty much stick to, if I have to, if I have to take a, si a side of an academic or a side of a publicist who writes an article, it's still my view. Let me ask you a little bit about, um, you know, Ukraine needs a lot of investment, foreign investment. Um, how do you get investors, what do you think should be sort of Ukraine's identity, economic identity? How do you sell Ukraine to investors to get them to come here when there's given, given there's been 23 years of a lot of corruption and, and sh investors being shy uh, to get involved in that? How do you, how do you I mean, I, 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 I can uh, want to add something to this uh, question because of, of, about corruption and when when you talk to investors, right, um, the main concern still is corruption. And they say that 
uh, for some during the last year, corruption got even worse. So if you sell a new identity of Ukraine to investors, they might be on board, but they will not come because of corruption. And we have, unfortunately, even uh, scandals inside the government uh, with accusation flying uh, about uh, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk from ex-top uh, economic uh, inspector, and for example, um, uh, Switzerland State Prosecutor is investigating Mikola Martinko, who is a close ally of Prime Minister Yatsenyuk. So consider this. How do you sell Ukraine where the corruption is still huge and a huge issue? Uh, we need to bring more people like myself, uh, people who come, who are clean, people who uh, talk business, mm -hmm. people who understand how foreign investors think. And those people should populate the government and represent the nation. And I think they will do a better job than people who have been in the government for about 20 years and have their way of looking at things. That's the first thing. Second thing is that, yes, Ukraine does need FDIs, foreign direct mm -hmm. investments, but, but before those come, Ukraine needs to unplug the potential that it has within the country. We need to liberalize the market, create the land market. We need to create a very modern tax system. We need to make sure that people who live here, they can do business and create opportunities that Western investors then will see mm -hmm. and will target the market as it is. Also, uh, Ukraine, Ukraine has an interesting position where it is associated with the EU, mm -hmm. but it's not treated as an accession it's country. It. And that gives Ukraine freedom to take advantage of the treaty that we have with the EU, but it doesn't have to, to just harmonize everything. Mm -hmm. We can be selective and we can create a very interesting model if we go smart about it, where investors can feel that they are in Europe and at the same time they t can take advantage of a more liberal system that Ukraine may create. And this is something that investors may like. But whenever you talk to the investors, first thing they talk about political stability and that of course, uh, what you guys been discussing just before the war mm -hmm. in the East and also the corruption and corruption and this is a common sentiment and for example we want to bring our viewers and there are comments so Sasha Greenick and he says we ask the question do you feel any progress in eliminating corruption post Maidan Ukraine and he says no progress whatsoever so it's I think it's not a radical view it's something that everybody talks about I want to ask you about um, do you, do you I, I mean I know that you just do and have on the job right but um, the other reformers that joined the government, they always publicly and uh, uh, in private express that there is you know, some kind of level of frustration for them because the system is too big, it's hard to reform it, whether it's corruption, whether it's inefficiency. Uh, do you have any kind of feel of frustration as a newcomer right now? There's something that kind of, yeah, it's something that bothers you the most at the moment. Uh, yeah, that bothers me the most at the moment. I, I feel that I came and people like myself came. I have a team that uh, pretty much are all expats, and many of them are you expats. You broke your, your team. No, I found them, or they found me. You know, birds of let stick together. And so, <laughs> so we, we got an excellent team. And the thing is that the system wants us to work their way. It's not that we come and there is an expectation that we will change the way system operates. It's rather than we come and the system says, okay, this is our way and you have to operate by running that same route that we've mm -hmm. been running forever. And we are not good in that. We, we stumble, we, we would like to change the system first. And when the, the video you showed, uh, we had dinner a few weeks ago and we discussed this with the professor where, where we said this, we need to first thing first, we need to change the system and then we can start reforms because if we have to start reforms and if we want new smart people come and work, we cannot have them run that same system, right? You, uh, I, we unfortunately we don't have a yeah. lot of time. 
And I think, yeah, the, the, the last question Saber wanted to ask. Well, I wanted to ask, I'll kind of, uh, just following up on that, do you think that one of Ukraine's biggest problems now, there is often a lot of criticism that they'll say it's still the old guard that's in, in power and that's what's blocking change. How do many you, how, of them yeah. do you feel like overwhelmed by old I mean, do you, guard? Is that an accurate assessment? That <laughs> yeah. the, that the uh, I share the sentiment and to pretty much any meeting that I go, we are outnumbered and they also know the system better. They play chess and we, we look at it and we don't understand how to, 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 to tangle. And uh, they the also, people that we brought in, the, the young generation, the mm -hmm. young blood, it's a somewhat middle level. It doesn't tackle the, the, the top level. The, the elite mm -hmm. on the top level has not changed, right? The economic elite has not changed. The political elite just barely changed. And so we feel that we, we, we are penetrating the system, but we don't have a decisive voice yet. We are still outnumbered. So Thank where, if there's, can we ask one more? Yeah, sure. If there's, uh, <laughs> it, it, when you have optimistic moments, where do they come from? Uh, they come from people like you, uh, from him because he's really young. Well, <laughs> no, no, no. Just with the questions he means you ask, investments. the questions you ask, you, <laughs> you ask the right questions. But also, I walk in every day into my office, and and it's an old Soviet office, and there are about 25 uh, volunteers sitting there. If someone is pulling something for digital agenda for Ukraine, mm -hmm. someone is making the. Uh, system of disbursing the international donor program money uh, in a clean, transparent way. Mm -hmm. And they come before I show up and they leave after I leave the office. So those young people, they give me the, they give a, the country the chance. They work for free, they work on the enthusiasm, their eyes are bright and shiny because they believe in what they are doing. And so they give us this short period of time when we can do something. Because if they walk away, that's it. If they get disappointed, we are cooked. Thank you again for joining but us on Sunday.